Yes, oh please, yes. I told my professor, who is resting now, teaching is hard work. I told him that I calculated that it is it exactly half a century since I sat in his classroom at Westminster Seminary, I think in the gatehouse, and learned wonderful things about Old Testament. I didn't tell him all the wonderful things I still remember. There aren't that many, actually, I remember. But I do remember two things. I'm sharing them with you um, because they don't particularly connect with Revelation, but hey, I still remember. Uh, I remember we, he taught the historical books course for us, and he was Dr. Robertson then. Now I get to call him Palmer, except when he calls me up front and I can't remember my own name, but that's why I always sat in the back. Anyway, um, but I, we got to Judges, and I remember the theme of the book of Judges is... Israel does not need a human king because the Lord is their king. And Israel needs a human king. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Both themes together. The Lord was their king to judge and to defend them and to rescue them, but he also had planned to give them a human king. So that leads us into the books of Samuel and Kings. And I remember the theme of First and Second Kings was the word of the king among the kings. Tell Palmer I remembered that stuff, would you, Joanna? It, it, it stuck. It stuck. Well, we have uh, just four sessions to deal with all of the, the issues in the book of Revelation, so I hope to have all of your answers questioned by the end. No, I mean, not all of your questions answered, but uh, what a wonderful book we get to spend some time in. Let me lead us in prayer as we begin our studies in Revelation. Father, we thank you for your word, your logos, that makes sense of everything. And we thank you for all that we heard this morning about how many important issues you have addressed and entrusted to your church through the Apostle Paul in those two epistles to the church at Corinth. And now we have a, a book before us addressed to seven first century churches uh, that also has a message that we need to hear and take to heart in order to endure and to stay pure under the assaults of your and our enemies. But we thank you that those enemies are already defeated, that Jesus the Lamb has already triumphed in the cross, and that that theme of the book of Revelation uh, pulses through every chapter as we will look so briefly at this rich book. Father, give us ears to hear. Jesus says to one church after another after another, if you have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We want to hear. We want to heed. We want to take to heart. We want to keep and wherefore, we want to receive the blessing that you promise in this wonderful book. So, Father, teach us, encourage us uh, in these uh, hours that we spend together in this climactic book of the whole scripture that you give us through the visions that you entrusted to your servant John on the island of Patmos. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So you have a handout. That's good. I should probably ask for one myself, but I've got my own outline. So I think I know where, where, where here's where we're going to go, okay? Today we're going to talk about mainly how to come at the book of Revelation. Uh, in both of the messages uh, today, we're going to talk about things about approach to the book. Uh, I did get to write the notes, uh, the Rafiki Bible study on Revelation, as uh, Palmer got to write First and Second Corinthians. And as he said this morning, we're not just doing what we did in those, which start at the beginning of the books and work through. We're kind of laying foundation that will help you uh, as you lead uh, your individual Bible study groups through the book of Revelation. Um, and so I'm going to talk about the keys. turned out that seven seemed to be a pretty good number uh, of keys to choose for the book of Revelation. I could probably come up with 12 or 
uh, 144,000 uh, or 1,000, but seven seem to be good. Uh, and so we're going to talk about seven keys. And then in the second message later on this afternoon, we're going to look a little bit more deeply into the structure of these visions. How do they relate to one another? So we get the big picture of what this book is all about. I have no idea where you've come from in your Christian life. I came from a church that was not over-the-top dispensational, but the people who cared about eschatology in the church I grew up in were dispensational. Uh, so I was exposed to that. Uh, and uh, in fact, when I came to teach at Westminster Seminary, I really didn't know what I thought about the book of Revelation. I was a I'd been a student. I'd been a pastor in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Still a little hazy on the book of Revelation. But my senior professor in, in the New Testament department, I mean, we were only two, and he said, you can teach any part of the New Testament curriculum you want as long as you will also take the, the course that covers Hebrews to Revelation. So I said, yes, sir. And I did that, and I started to teach that block of the New Testament the way I had been taught at Westminster, which was, oh, two-thirds to three-quarters of the course on the book of Hebrews, and then a glance or two at First Peter, and actually, when I took it at Westminster, not from Palmer, um, the assignment for the book of Revelation is turn in an outline of the book. I tried that at Westminster, California for a while, and students began to say, you know, actually, people are going to ask us questions about this book. Uh, if you've glanced at my commentary, I didn't really think of it as a commentary until PNR called it that, but Triumph of the Lamb, it's over here on the table. You see on the very first, first page, I mention a, a 19th century commentary that runs two volumes, well over 1,000 pages. If any of you are familiar with Greg Beale's mega commentary. Beale's got nothing on Moses Stewart because he's about twice as long as Beale, in the, in the big Beale. Um, but Stewart says early on that his students uh, at uh, another Presbyterian seminary, sadly not Princeton, but anyway, which is the forerunner of Westminster, but at another seminary would began to importune him, isn't that a great old word? Began to beg him to teach on the book of Revelation, so he was going to try to get into it and help them, and basically he says in much more beautiful 19th century language, I told them, I have nothing good to say, to, worthwhile to say to you, and then he dissolved, resolved to spend 10 years with his other duties devoted to reading through the Old Testament prophets. Then he would begin to try to teach the book of Revelation. Well, that's one of the points in our seven keys but uh, I finally began to dare to say a little bit in the class, and then I had a little 30-page uh, little intro, and our bookstore manager said, you ought to put that, send that to a publisher, and it ended up as Triumph of the Lamb. But I've, I've been on a, on a growing, uh, on a learning curve in Revelation for a long time, and I, I still don't know at all. Uh, years later, I was preaching someplace, and I was coming back on a Sunday evening uh, while I was teaching at Westminster. I know Jane and the kids weren't with me, and I was wanting to make sure I'd stayed awake, so I turned on the radio, and I, lis I suddenly came in on the middle of a program that sounded like uh, Orson Welles' radio thing of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. And, you know, there were explosions, and there were generals shouting, commands, and there were shrieks of terror, and I thought, whoa, this is really interesting. Then there was a commercial break, and I was listening to the uh, Left Behind Radio Theater <laughs> that was built off of, obviously, Tim LaHaye's and Jerry Jenkins' uh, best-selling series, uh, and then I remembered, at least in part, why so many times pastors, except pastors who preach only on the book of Revelation, may tend to never preach on the book of Revelation because they're scared away from it. We think it's confusing, we know it's controversial, and it's just, there's a lot of suffering and bloodshed and violence in this book. It's a kind of a downer, right? Everybody agree on that, that it's really a discouraging book? Good, I'm glad you did. I've got a few disagreeing. That's because it's a book of incredible but realistic encouragement. It's a book that promises blessing. 
Seven promises of blessing. That's just blessed is. Then there are the blessings that are tucked into the end of every one of the letters to the churches in chapters 2 and 3. So it's all about blessing, but you have to come about it the way it tells you to come about it. So that's what we're going to look at, these seven keys. And I'm going to try to work my way through in efficient time, so we have some question time at the end uh, as well. So first, this is a no-brainer, but not everybody believes it. Revelation is given to reveal, not to confuse, but to make clear. Its Greek title, and it's sometimes referred to this way in some English translations, is apocalypsis, which comes from, I put it in English characters because they weren't sure you were all classically trained like our Rafiki kids <laughs> to read Greek. Apocalypsis, which comes from a word that Palmer mentioned to us this morning, the Greek word kaluma, when Moses came down Mount Sinai with his face glowing and delivered the law, and then it began to fade, he put a kaluma over his face. That's the term in 2 Corinthians 3. So that they couldn't see the fading, the fact that the Old Testament had built-in obsolescence, that God was designing to speak something better now through the gospel. So kaluma is a veil, a pa means to take away something. It's a preposition that means... So it's taking away a veil. It's, it's helping you to see behind the things that our eyes can see. It's intended to reveal. It's intended to help us understand what we can see in the light of realities that explain what we cannot see. And it's a revelation of Jesus Christ actually in two senses. That word of, uh, pretty good reflection of what's going on with the, with the Greek case there. Uh, it's in two senses. In, in one, it reveals Christ. That is, it tells us about Jesus Christ. And it tells us about him as vision in chapter 1, the one like a son of man from the vision in Daniel 7. He is a slain and risen lamb. Think of the echo of Isaiah 53. That's Revelation chapter 5. He is the child of the woman promised in Genesis 3.15 who would crush the serpent's head. That's Revelation 12. And he's the Lord's Christ also there in Revelation 12. We're going to look about that tomorrow afternoon. He is the word of God who has a sharp sword proceeding from his mouth, Revelation 19. He is the Alpha and the Omega that's the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. And that title he uses for himself in the first and the last chapters of the book of Revelation, the Alpha and the Omega. He's the everything. So it's about Jesus Christ, but it's also the revelation that Jesus Christ reveals. In other words, it comes from him or through him. In fact, what I'm going to do, because all of these points are illustrated in the first chapter, is what I want to do right now is just pause at this point and have you, well, let me, no, I'm going to go to one more point here, and that's point C there. Uh, blessing, the first of the seven blessings is the blessing that we read in verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and keep what is written in it for the time is near. One reader many listeners. So what I want to do right now is give you a kind of an experience of what the church in Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira and so on would have experienced. They have no Bibles in front of them. Palmer mentioned that this morning, right? They, they, they don't have New Testament. Te they, may, they may have, I don't know, some of the richer churches might have a copy of the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint. They might, but they don't have a copy of the book of Revelation. But the messenger has come from the island of Patmos, where John has received these visions, uh, the things that he saw and was, he was told to write down, and he goes to the church at Ephesus, and then next up the coast to Smyrna, and then further up. And everybody listens. Everybody listens. Jane and I are delighted to be in Tennessee. Absolutely. One thing we kind of miss about San Diego is the Lambs Players Theater, a Christian residential dramatic company that has plays all year round. 
Once they hosted an evening, not one of their own staff, but a visitor who came in, and the only thing he did for the whole evening was to speak the book of Revelation to us from start to finish. That's the closest thing that probably any of us would have had, certainly that we've had, to how the first century churches would have experienced this book. We're just going to do it for one chapter, so don't look at your Bibles, okay? I just got off the boat from Patmos, got special clearance from the Roman prison uh, guards there to visit with John and they sent it, and I want you to hear it, just hear it, Okay? And it will illustrate all of the points, including this first point. You can get a lot by listening. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I became in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and in the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. We heard it. We heard it. Jesus says, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So there's blessing. But just think about that. They have no concordances. Right? They have no Bible apps. They don't have the text in front of them. But God promises, if you hear this and hold it, keep it, take it to heart, I will bless you. So, yes, there are going to be complexities. There are going to be things that confuse us in the book of Revelation. But fundamentally, we need to come to the book of Revelation with the anticipation God wants us to understand this book. 
He wants us to get the message. And he's put it in a form, actually the visual form, we're going to come to that in just a second, the visual form is a way that people who don't have the text in front of them can retain in a wonderful way uh, the, the truth. So principles uh, of number one. Jesus is going to entrust this, I didn't go all that way with that, but Jesus will entrust this revelation to his angel who will deliver it to John, who will preach it to the churches. We're going to see that dramatized tomorrow when we look at, especially at Revelation 4 and 5. We're going to see that whole chain of, uh, of instruction. But the principle is Jesus wants us to know this. The Father wants us to know this because he's given it to Christ to reveal to show to his churches so that we might be blessed. Expect to understand because God gives it to us to bless us. And obviously, if it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, it's not the revelation of John, the apostle, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, about him and from him. Focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus, okay? Point number one. Key number two, Revelation is a book to be seen. Yes, we hear it. Yes, it's in words on a page, but it's painting pictures for us all over the place. It's painting pictures for us. In fact, in the very first uh, sentence, uh, well, second sentence in our English here, but that's okay. Uh, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant. That word made it known the Old King James Version translated signified. That was a great choice. Our newer translations are great. I love them. I use the ESV. I use the NASB. I even use the NIV sometimes. But none of them capture what the King James Version did because that word signified in English, which comes to us through Latin, but anyway, has the word sign in it, right? The Greek word right here has the, word, the Greek word sign in it. God showed by signs. And so we'll come later on, we'll come to chapter 12, and John will see a great sign in heaven, a woman who's about to give birth to a son who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Well, that's obviously from Psalm 2. He's the Messiah. And a dragon who wants to kill her son. A great sign. Signs. At the beginning, we are told this is a book that communicates in imagery, in symbolism, in signs, to be seen. Some of the signs are clearly labeled or explained. Like at the end of the text that I read here, which we call chapter 1, uh, Jesus explains, you see seven stars in my hand, they're the angels of the seven churches. Now that itself requires an explanation, but I'm not going to do it right now, so there. Uh, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches, okay? So there are some that are interpreted clearly. Uh, the woman, uh, we'll get, we're going to look at that a little bit more tomorrow afternoon, but the, the woman references Genesis 3.15, which Palmer mentioned this morning, when God said to Satan through the serpent, the offspring of the woman will crush your head as you wound his heel. So we're taking, Genesis 12.1 takes us all the way back to history right after the fall into sin. And then it takes us all the way into the future. So lampstands uh, are churches, stars are the angels of churches. The dragon in chapter 12, as we'll see, he's not just a dragon, he's that ancient serpent. Oh, that serpent. And in case you're a little hazy on whether that is really what's at, at stake there. He's also given the two names that we're most familiar with in the Bible. He's also Satan and devil. No question. You know, the great enemy of God's people is not a mythical reptile. It's Satan. But the picture, so vivid of the hostility of Satan. So pictures are obviously symbols, sometimes explained, sometimes actually labeled. But the interpreted symbols, or the ones that are so clearly symbolic, are so deeply interwoven with other aspects of the drama that we're really led to see that all that the story is being told is in symbol form. I grew up in a church. I have good friends who teach in other traditions who say, 
If you want to play it safe with the book of Revelation, you have to interpret everything literally if you possibly can. The longer I work in the book of Revelation, it seems to me that not just verse 1, but the whole book is saying, actually, you need to interpret everything symbolically if you possibly can. That should be your default setting, that God is speaking in pictures. He's speaking in uh, imagery. Uh, Not surprising that that would happen. Uh, When God the Son came to earth, he very often taught in pictures, right? Story pictures that we call parables. Uh, Even long before that, God spoke to his people in pictures. Uh, So there was a certain king, I think, uh, the ancestor of David, wrote a few songs, right? Including Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, right? So God talks this way all the time, but certainly in Revelation he talks this way, as he does in the visions of some of the Old Testament prophets, especially Daniel and Zechariah, which are often the source of the imagery. Uh, Now, that means the numbers also are symbolic. Uh, And I've actually been in a discussion with a a father in the Lord who, who taught at a dispensational seminary. We had a wonderful conversation with a bunch of pastors in Northern California uh, and which he was saying that you've got to take the numbers literally. And I, with gentleness and respectfulness, said, but you don't believe there are seven Holy Spirits, do you? We're all on the same page on that. You know, but John does, more than once, portray the Holy Spirit with a sevenfold description, sevenfold lamps before God, sevenfold eyes of the Lamb. They are interpreted as the, spirit, the seven spirits of God or the sevenfold spirit, we might say, but that's not quite what the Greek says. Uh, we don't take that number literally. I'm going to suggest that numbers like, oh, a thousand, we're going to get to Revelation 20 tomorrow, uh, is a symbolic number. Uh, that 144,000 is a symbolic number. They're meant to say some things, uh, but not to be used to calculate. So symbolic numbers, lots of symbolic numbers. Why does God speak this way? Well, for vividness, among other things. Uh, I remember as a kid, young kid, uh, I mean, we finally did see Billy Graham's The Thief in the, in the, the Thief in the Night, right? But this was before that movie came out, and I remember seeing film strips, uh, not even video, but just film strips of some of the visions of Revelation having nightmares. It was vivid. It was a little scary. Uh, I suppose it was the commentary along with the film strip. So there's vividness. It helps us to keep things in mind, sometimes in a scary way. Uh, But also, uh, the other aspect is that there's a certain ambiguity about the symbols. And, And that means we could let our imaginations run wild in a lot of strange directions. So we need wisdom. Uh to be able to understand uh, what's going on there. Uh, And Revelation says, this calls for wisdom. We need to be wise. How do we connect the symbols with the realities that they point to? And it's especially complicated because sometimes the realities that they point to seem like the opposite of what the symbols are pointing to. There's this theme of paradox. It seems like it can't be. Um, And when we get to chapter 5, we will hear that John hears that there is one individual in the entire reality who is worthy to open the scroll of the plan of God for the rest of history. And that individual is the lion of the tribe of Judah who has conquered. And when John looks to see what he sees is a lamb who's been slain. I mean, talk about paradox. The conquering lion is the slain lamb who is standing. So as the Son of Man says here, I died and I'm alive again forevermore. So he's, there's resurrection already here and in chapter 5. But there's the paradox. There's the paradox. Conquering lion. And he does it by becoming a slain lamb. So we need wisdom. 
We need a lot of wisdom. But we do want to adopt the principle, the assumption is we're going to assume that this book speaks in symbols, and then we're going to ask, how do we understand the symbols? And that then raises the question, where are the guardrails on our wild imaginations, right? Uh, and, and this brings us to key number three. Uh, the Old Testament supplies Revelation's symbolic vocabulary. Palmer mentioned to us this morning the number of times in the book's in the letters to the Corinthians, where Paul cites Scripture by saying, it is written, or according to the Scriptures. How many times do we find it is written introducing an Old Testament quotation, or according to the Scriptures in the book of Revelation? Any guesses? That's right, zero. Zero. No, it is written, or as it was written by the prophet Isaiah. And yet, the Old Testament just permeates the visions given to John. Not by way of quotation, but by way of all kinds of connections and allusions. You've already heard it in some of the descriptions of the titles of Jesus, all drawn from the Old Testament. So, especially passages like Daniel 7, where we, in this first vision that we heard, Uh, Jesus appears as one like a son of man, uh, but he also has characteristics of the ancient of days, God the Father in Daniel 7, in that his hair is white like wool. So he's truly human and the representative of God's human people on earth, but he's also divine in that vision, in that combination of one like a son of man with hair as white as wool, as white as snow, he is God and man. Later on in the Revelation, the, the beasts that start Daniel's vision, lion, bear, leopard, and one with ten horns, reappear now in a single beast. Uh, visions from Zechariah also uh, become an echo. The lampstand idea uh, comes from the vision of Zechariah 4 and interpreted back in Zechariah chapter 3. The Old Testament. This is why Moses Stewart was so wise to tell his students, I'm not going to tell you anything about the book of Revelation until I've saturated my heart and mind in the Old Testament prophets. And it's not just the prophets, because obviously, as you heard, we've already heard the reference to Genesis 3.15 in the woman whose offspring, that's a, that's a narrative text in the books of Moses, There's going to be references to Exodus and the ministry of Moses. There's going to be reference to the ministry of Elijah in the Old Testament. Uh, There's all kinds of echoes. But that's the key. Not, Not to take a look at a vision, say a vision of locusts, and think, wow, those sure look to me like attack helicopters. Um, yeah, I'd read the late great planet Earth too. Sure, why not, right? All that kind of stuff. No, 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 no. First of all, our first century brothers and sisters could get the point. So maybe instead of trying to look from their standing point, standpoint 20 years into the future, 20 centuries into the future, we should be looking back to what we and they share, and that's the Old Testament, and saying, how, did, how should I understand these locusts and other things in the light of the Old Testament. So we start, when we're reading Revelation, we hear those echoes of the Old Testament in the imagery and in the references. We start with the Old Testament symbols and their meaning, but we can expect that there will be some changes as a result of fulfillment that Jesus has brought. The lion conquers by being the lamb. 144,000 Israelites Tribes given in Revelation 7. That's what John hears, and what does John see? An international multitude from all the, you know not to say just Gentiles anymore, right? You were here this morning. From all the nations. And nations are not national boundaries, they're ethnic groups, ethne, right? That's what John sees. The tribes of Israel in fulfillment are the peoples of the world who are now children, as Paul would say, children of Abraham, 
by faith. So, Old Testament, crucial. Key number four, we're moving along here. Revelation provides multiple perspectives, varying camera angles through video replays, or we could call it, big long Latin word, recapitulation. Uh, You could say kind of that often what God does in Revelation through these visions is he tells us what he's going to tell us, and then he tells us, and then he tells us what he told us. (laughs) He does that a lot. But I like the imagery of video replay in football. Uh, I have not followed football very much until we moved to Tennessee, but hey, college football is the thing. Yeah, NFL, fine. But college football and University of Tennessee football had a good year. So imagine now, and there were many of these, uh, when Hendon Hooker, our quarterback, uh, would fade back a little bit, he'd get good protection, he'd find one of his split ends, pass it, great catch, tip of, the, tip of the fingers, and into the end zone. And you know, you're going to see that three or four more times in the next minute or two, right? Uh, it'll be one with the focus on the quarterback, another one on the split end, maybe another one on the offensive line. Uh, if you thought, oh, wow, we just scored 28 points. Well, apart from the extra points, yeah, okay, I should do, deduct those. But anyway, you, you get the point. No, it's one play from several different camera angles. That's what the books of Revelation do. The book of Revelation does. Shows us one event, and, and the classic example is in Revelation 12, uh, where there are two visions back to back. The dragon wants to destroy the woman's child, and it's ready to, and she gives birth, and her child is snatched up to the throne of God. Boom! And the dragon can't do anything to that child, can't destroy him. Now that's the whole life of Jesus in that nutshell of a sentence there. His birth, all the persecution from the point of Herod's putting out the the hit list on the boys of Bethlehem to all the temptations leading up to the cross. And Jesus is faithful all the way through. Satan never won. And Christ is now seated at the right hand of God. And so Satan is now out to destroy the woman who gave him birth, the covenant people of God. Take number two in Revelation. Michael and the armies of God fighting against the dragon, and the dragon is cast down from heaven. Some scholars, I think fewer, maybe now, would say, well, this is about when Satan fell before the human fall. But no, we're going to talk about that tomorrow. That is about the effect of the death and resurrection of Christ. Uh, In fact, we're going to hear Jesus say tomorrow about his disciples' ministry, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And we know that's what it's about because the heavenly chorus in Revelation 12 says, the accuser of our brothers has been cast down. He can't accuse us any longer. Why not? They've conquered by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So there's a a double replay, back to back. I'm going to suggest there's one more in chapter 20, but stay tuned for tomorrow on that. Recapitulation, it's all over the place. Uh, and Jesus keeps saying, I'm, I'm showing you this again and again and again. So that even though, in a certain sense, as we'll see in the next uh, message, in a certain sense, Revelation 4, 1 and following are about things that are going to take place after these things, that is, after the state of the churches that John is addressing in chapters 2 and 3, or Jesus is addressing, in a certain sense, Jesus keeps taking us back, as I said, Revelation 12, all the way to the beginning, and then taking us forward again. And this is not unusual. Uh, I think somewhere here I have recapitulation in Old Testament examples, right? Visions and dreams. Uh, I'm running all over the place, but... Uh, You can track with me, page two, uh, 4D. We've seen this, God God do this before, right? Joseph gets two dreams as a a young brother uh, uh, to his older brothers uh, about the sheaves and his brother's sheaves of wheat bow down to his sheaf, made him really popular, (laughs) not. And then he gets another dream, almost seems like right on the heels of it, where the sun, moon, and stars, 11 stars, bow down to him, the star, 
And then even his father is bothered by that one. Uh, that what do you, Who do you think you are? Twofold dreams. The brothers don't like it. Want to kill him. Instead, they sell him to some traders who sell him to Egypt. He ends up in prison. He ends up interpreting some dreams there that have very different meanings for the cupbearer and the baker. But eventually, the cupbearer remembers he's pretty good at doing these dream things when Pharaoh has two dreams, right? Fat cows swallowed up by skinny, scrawny cows, seven of them. Fat sheaves, real full sheaves or, or heads of wheat, swallowed up by dried wither uh, sheaves of wheat. And, and Joseph says, well, Pharaoh, what's going on here is you're going to have seven years of great abundant harvest and then seven years of ultimate famine. So you need to get ready. And the fact that God repeated it in these different forms means it's certain, and God intends to make it happen soon. So God does that. So it's not surprising that we're going to have recapitulation. God's saying the same thing from different camera angles in Revelation. I'm going to skip some of that. You got the point. How about this one, number five? Revelation concerns what must soon take place. Not just soon from 1948 when the state of Israel was reestablished, but soon from the perspective of those first century churches that uh, received this book, heard it read aloud when John received it, I think in the, about the 90s, as Palmer was saying, we think that's when the canon of the New Testament was closed as the last apostles were being taken from the scene. Some think Revelation belongs a couple decades earlier. Uh, I'm not, not so persuaded of that. But in any case, soon from the standpoint of those first century churches in Ephesus and so on, uh, how could Jesus say that? But he says it not only in this first chapter, he says it again at the end. And in the end, he actually says, now, John, don't you, you don't seal up this book, which is exactly the opposite of what the Lord had said to Daniel in Daniel 12. God said, Daniel, there's, and Daniel's trying to figure out what these visions are about. God says, Daniel, you just seal this up. This is for the time of the end. When it happens, people will understand it, but you may not. Jesus says to John, don't seal it up because the time is at hand. So if we come up with a way of reading Revelation that is completely removed by thousands of years from those first century churches and their experience, we almost certainly have it wrong. We almost certainly have it wrong. It touches on their lives. At the same time, there are hints in the book of Revelation that while some things are happening soon, some things are not going to happen as soon as you think they are. Uh, that there's a, we need to be prepared for the long haul. And this, of course, was one of the points of Jesus in some of his parables. Be prepared for the long haul. Don't give up hope if the master of the house doesn't come back when you think he's going to or should. Don't believe, Peter says, 2 Peter 3, right? Don't believe those people who say, where is the coming he promised? Because God is patient. Uh, God's timeline is not your timeline. So anticipate that things are going to take a longer time. And that, I think, is part of the reason why we're shown this picture of a very long, many generation time frame between the binding of Satan, this is Revelation 20, the binding of Satan so he can no longer deceive the nations, which Jesus says happened in his first coming, and the ultimate coming of Jesus at the end of a very long period of time to destroy Satan altogether. A thousand years. Now we know numerically it's been more than that, but first century hearers are going to think, well, that's beyond our lifetime. Well, yeah, it is. It's a long time beyond our lifetime. We're going to come back to that tomorrow. So yes, expect that com things are coming soon, but also that question how long, which the martyrs under the throne ask the Lord in Revelation 6, hints that uh, the enemy's destruction is not as near as we might wish. 
Revelation's visions symbolize events that from the standpoint of the first century churches of Asia Minor are in the near future, but also in the distant future. So the whole church needs to endure. Which leads us to key six, and that is Revelation is for a church under attack. The blessings to overcomers. Overcomers, that's that language of triumph in each of the churches, each, each of the letters to the churches remind us we are under attack. And the letters to the churches in chapters 2 and 3 show the variety of attacks. Later on, they're symbolized by a beast that comes out of the ocean for the first century churches in Ephesus and so on. What came out of the ocean, what came out of the Aegean Sea as it opened out onto the Mediterranean Sea was what? Roman troops coming on Roman, uh, Roman boats. They came across the ocean. And that's Rome, as we'll see. That's Rome with its pretension. That's Rome with its insistence on supremacy of Caesar. That's Rome with its imposing its will by violence. But John also sees a beast that comes up out of the land. And at least for those first century churches, and we see hints of it in chapters 2 and 3, these are local religious leaders, false prophet he's called, who say we ought to worship Rome. Many of these cities had shrines to the genius of the goddess Roma, the patroness of the whole empire, or to a particular Caesar, usually one that was deceased, but it was still, it was civil religion. It was, you know using religious coercion and deception to make people trust the government for everything. Uh, and then, of course, later on we see uh, the prostitute, Babylon, uh, and a lot of emphasis on how much people love the pleasure that Babylon gives and, how, and the prosperity and the, and the merchandising back and forth. Um, and so these are the enemies uh, that John will see, and they take various forms in the particular uh, experience of the individual churches. Uh, some of the churches are persecuted. Of the seven churches, the church in Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia, the second and the second to last, and by the way, I could draw the map, but these actually follow an order. Yeah, I will. We got time, right? I'm just taking your, your Q&A time, right? Okay, so picture, this is Turkey, kind of, something like that. Okay, Patmos is out here. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, I'm forgetting one now, Sardis. Who have I forgotten? Philadelphia. Philad oh, Philadelphia and Laodicea, basically like that. So the messenger would go, yeah, 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 one to one to one. And what's fascinating is that those who have studied these ancient Roman towns uh, say there's interesting connections of what Jesus says to the churches and what we know about the cities as well. But uh, in any case, uh, here we have Smyrna, here we have Philadelphia. These are the most persecuted churches. But all the churches have one form of attack that is going on them. Uh, some of them are false teaching. Ephesus resists the false teachers. Others succumb to the false teachers. Some of it, it's just personal peace and affluence. That's what Francis Schaeffer used to say was the American idolatry. Personal peace and affluence. Don't bother me and give me lots of stuff. So Laodicea says, hey, I'm good to go. You know, I don't need anything. I'm fine. I'm richy. I'm wealthy. wealthy I'm healthy. Uh, and Jesus says, you don't have any idea how wretched, miserable, naked, poor, and blind you are. That's an attack. And so the theme comes out again and again. You're under attack, so endure. And the attack is going to come not just from outside with threats and persecution. It's going to come from within, from compromise, so stay pure. See, this is not about just armchair sitting back and reading an interesting puzzle. It's about fortifying God's people. The principle is recognize and resist the dragon's complex and subtle assaults on the church and on our faith. Well, finally, the victory belongs to God 
and to his Christ. Uh, and we see it here in the first chapter when Jesus says he has died, is now alive, and he holds the keys of death and hell. That he has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom. And so as we're going to see tomorrow afternoon, our last session, Revelation is just peppered with songs of celebration, songs, scenes of worship and songs of of celebration, and there's a confident expectation that earth's destroyers will be destroyed, that Christ's patient martyrs will be vindicated, and in fact, that the whole curse on the whole first heaven and earth will be reversed. There will be a new heavens and a new earth, and the curse will be no more. A new Jerusalem that is the bride of the Lamb. So the principle is let Revelation's visions lead you to worshipful confidence in your champion, not to trembling terror at your enemy. That was my problem with the film strips. I kept thinking only about how bad it's going to be during the tribulation, and I did not want to be left behind. But I forgot to look at how great Jesus is and that he's already won the victory. So those are the keys.